that be a fossil fuel model. Another example, um, you can ignore the person on the right, the man shirt, sure. um, comment on the, the person on the left, his name is Abdul Rahman um, Mahdi. He was uh, for many years the head of the largest Muslim organization in the world, Nana Kalbul Ulama, has some 15 million members. It's based in Indonesia. Uh, in the year 2000, around Christmas, it didn't make the newspapers, but some, in Indonesia, some 36 churches in 18 cities were bombed by radicals. Okay, the, as I always like to comment, you remember the Bali bombing in 2002, and the newspaper headline that said terrorism came, comes to Indonesia, and I wrote a piece to say, terrorism is not coming to Indonesia, it's been there a long time, there were 11,000 dead Christians. But a Christian cemetery, hospital, and uh, the residence for these Christian girls was amongst those places attacked. It was destroyed, and um, there were several hundred Christian girls who were homeless. So, um, Wahid um, took, I believe it was about 60 of these girls, into his house uh, for somewhere to stay. He had a very big house, I'll explain why. And said they would stay there as long as they needed until they uh, found you know, some permanent arrangement that could be made. Um, what was especially interesting in this is that at that time, uh, Wahid was president of Indonesia. So the house he actually took them into, the Indonesian built in the White House. So you had all these Christian students <coughs> in the bedrooms and sleeping in the hallway and whatever. Abdul Rahman Wahid. Is also a Muslim. <coughs> I just give these few sort of brief vignettes, which could obviously be multiplied, to show that um, if we're dealing with Muslims, we're dealing with a great variety of people. And tomorrow morning, I'll, I'll try to illustrate um, some of that variety. But having got a sense of uh, Muslims as particular people and also very individual people, then. Um, uh, let us turn now to um, some basic Muslim beliefs. Muslims believe that uh, Muhammad was born in Mecca in approximately the year 570. Let's move on to Okay, the uh, Mecca is right here. And uh, a, a trading commercial town on, on the west coast of, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. So he was born there in the year 570. Uh, his father died when he was hardly two years old, and his mother died just a few years later. Uh, when he was 40, um, he began telling people that he was receiving visions and being spoken to in dreams by the angel Gabriel. Who told him that there was but one God? Then Muhammad told people of these visions and slowly acquired a band of followers. He also acquired opposition because a central part of his message and very strong in, in Islam is opposition to idolatry. And Mecca had very many gods, had very many idols, and uh, as you probably know, in much of the ancient world, at this point, if you regard America as part of the ancient world, that's uh, temples and idols and uh, trade went together. Temples are where the money changes were. Uh, people would come and bring their gifts to the temples. So temples had to deal with all sorts of currencies. And uh, when, when Hammond began denouncing all these idols in the city, this was also an attack on the trade and income of the city. Uh, St. Paul in Ephesus is also a very clear example in the same dynamic. So he uh, received opposition and attacks, and uh, in 1622, at the age of 52, fled from Mecca to a town then called Yathrib, now called Medina. Uh, this flight from Mecca to Medina is, is extremely important for 
Muslims, called the Haggadah or the Chara. Uh, the Muslim calendar dates from this, not from the birth of Muhammad, not from the beginning of the dreams for the Quran, not from the death of Muhammad, uh, but from the Hajar. <clears throat> That's because uh, Muhammad was believed to go to Medina and then he was invited there and to take essentially a ruling position and have a community of Muslims. Uh, in Christian terms, it was like the establishment of a church. It's now a Muslim community in Muslim city for the first time. And so the calendar dates from that. After various battles, often with the people back in Mecca, he returned to Mecca in triumph in the year 630 and died there two years later. Uh, so, comment on the uh, sort of life of Muhammad. And the revelation that Muslims believe he received was written down as the Quran. Uh, Muhammad himself was not maintained that he was illiterate, he could not read. The Quran itself is, has a central place in, within Islam. The place of the Quran within Islam is more central than the place of the Bible within Christianity. We'll get back to that. It is, if you have sought to read the Quran or read the Quran, it can be a very difficult book, uh, often poetic uh, and rapturous. Again, if we want to parallel the Christian scriptures, it might remind you of something like the book of Revelation rather than reading the book of Romans or something like that. And the collection we have, we have now, if you, if you buy a Quran, uh, it's the order in which it's printed is the longest chapter to the shortest. It's not the entire order. So it's, it's a very difficult book to, uh, to get into without knowing much about it. Uh, I mentioned the centrality of the Quran. Um, the, for Muslims, they believe the Quran was dictated to Muhammad, and then, then it's written down. Um, uh, Christians, generally Orthodox Christians, do not believe the Bible, or at least most of the Bible, is in fact dictated. When Paul wrote his letters, was not saying all the time that you know, God is speaking to me and says this. Uh, Paul is, is writing as, as an apostle on who knew the Lord, uh, who was schooled in the church. Uh, he's writing what he believes to be true. And uh, as Christians, we believe that God inspired Paul and Isaiah and Job and the four evangelists. So, this is the word of God, it's true that God speaks through that. But usually not in a form of a dictation, whereby the sort of personality of the person involved disappears. You know if, if you read one of Peter's epistles, or Paul's epistles, or you read the epistles of the Hebrews, you can tell it's written by a different person. Because the style, you get some sense of who they are. With the Quran, it's only God speaking. You, the idea is there's no real flavor. And in fact, uh, Muslims go further and believe that the Quran was not created. It existed eternally in heaven before it came to Muhammad. In fact, there have been disputes about this in, in Muslim history. And at one point, in fact, um, at, at one point, people were being killed for being on the wrong side of this particular debate. In fact, a uh, a school teacher in, um, in Saudi Arabia was arrested <clears throat> uh, three years ago uh, for holding the view that, uh, that the Quran was created. But the, the dominant view at the moment is the Quran was not created, it always is in heaven. So while Muslim say it's not divine, that's, that's a difficult point, but it's in many ways one of the closest things you can get. And for this reason, um, the Quran, in some ways, is a parallel to Jesus. Uncreated, you know, the Apostles' Creed, begotten, not made, but begotten, not created. Existing eternally with the Father. 
um, and sort of embodied in his life and started incarnation in Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. Um, so to speak, the Quran is the Word of, word of God made, made Word. It, it's a very divine. So obviously all these parallels break down. If we're looking for analogies. The Quran gets quite close to Jesus. And that also means the, uh, the actual physical embodiment of the Quran is sacred. As you know, the, the, that famous Newsweek story of a year, uh, two years ago, where it, was, it turned out to be false, that someone in Batan Bay had watched the Quran out of the toilet, or whatever. But the actual physical object of the Quran is very dear to, uh, to Muslims. Uh, I remember a uh, a couple of years ago, talking to Dudley Woodbury, I used to be the dean of uh, the School of World Mission at um, at Fuller Seminary, and a very accomplished scholar in that. And uh, Dudley, amongst his other things, he used to be a, a pastor in the Church of Kabul in Afghanistan. They had a big family reunion, so they decided to go and have it in Kabul. Uh, this, by the way, was where the Taliban were in Kabul. And um, said so they raided his house at the meeting, looking for Bible or Bibles. And Dudley said, he says, I felt bad really. They never found it because they put it on the bottom shelf. <laughs> and they would never dream that you would put a sacred book so close to the ground. So they didn't look. So the actual the physical thing, it's a sort of a, a blasphemous thing. Also, another thing about the Quran is it, it cannot be translated. I mean, cannot, the translation uh, cannot be regarded as the, the true Quran. Uh, if you see an English translation, it will usually be described as an interpretation of the Holy Quran, or it will say the meaning of the Holy Quran. But uh, translation itself must always be a loss. The Quran is an Arabic. And bear in mind, this means that the uncreated Quran was Arabic. So that Arabic has existed in heaven since the beginning of uncreated. This also gives the language Arabic a status which say that Hebrew and uh, Greek would, would not have the language in heaven. That's why it cannot really be, really be translated. And so within Islam there's more translations recently. Uh, but historically Muslims would not translate the Bible, Muslim missionaries would not translate it. But you know, everybody had to learn out. And that's how you do it. So often the spread of Islam was very much with the, the spread of Arabic. That a, you know, a better Muslim was, was really uh, <coughs> So it, get, it gets very close. This has a major cultural uh, impact. Any of you have ever heard of Lam and Sane, who now teaches at Yale, uh, lecture on this, um, about the very different relation to culture was Christian missionaries go in, find out the language of the people, and then translate the Bible. It's often one of the first things you do, and they have the word of God done. Was Muslims traditionally have not done that. And Alam Sani incidentally maintains that this has been one of the a major factors in the preservation of many traditional cultures, because Christians gave an alphabet and written text where there wasn't one before. And cultures who have writing survived much better than cultures. Uh, we simply have an oral tradition. So again, one gets into the centrality of the Quran. Uh, as you, you probably know, for many Muslims, it's an act of great piety to be able to memorize the Quran. And in, 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 uh, in some madrasas, not all, uh, but about all that is done is Quran memorization. There are children five, six years, seven years old in Pakistan who have memorized the Quran and can recite the whole thing, but who cannot speak Arabic. They have not the slightest idea what it says, but they know the words. So again, the structure of the words language uh, it, it is very important. And in, in this sense, don't think of it too closely as something like so that's one of the, the central source of, of written revelation.
for Muslims, and the only in, within Islam, written revelation is the only form of revelation. Okay, there, there is no other form. Whereas in Christianity, the word becomes flesh and becomes, so to speak, within Islam, the word becomes word. Uh, words, sentences, structures, rules, etc. The other major source of Muslim re uh, revelation is um, the, the sayings and acts attributed to Muhammad. Uh, these are collected together and is uh, usually called the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H. -E uh, people slowly compiled these over the centuries as a whole science and discipline of Muslims of trying to establish the validity of a hadith. If something is accepted as a true saying of Muhammad, you must be able to trace back uh, that sentence to someone who actually heard it and know who they said it, who they had told, who told them, who told them, who told them. And you must be able to trace it back, and all those people must be a good character. So you have to go for the character. So, a tremendous effort to do this, but again, the collections uh, for these studies uh, did not appear until somewhat over 200 years uh, after Muhammad's death. So, uh, scholars, these are scholars who were brave enough to say so publicly. Uh, some scholars believe that. Uh, you know, sort of critical interpretations of, of the Hadith or even of the Quran, uh, would show quite a few deviations. The Hadith are much longer than the Quran, uh, now much more organized, and in practical terms, are the source of a great deal of uh, Muslim teaching. And they give guidance. Again, uh, within Islam, as you know, Muslims do not regard Muhammad as divine. They don't regard Jesus as divine either. Uh, so he's not God. He's not divine. But he is a perfect man. Which meant that everything he said and did was correct and true. Therefore, everything that Muhammad said and did should be imitated, should be copied should be called by Muslims. So the Hadith themselves tell you about Muhammad at Tawa Ia also become guidance uh, to what to do. And since they come from a much wider range of the Quran, in many ways, though, the Hadith are sort of slightly lower level of revelation. Uh, nevertheless, uh, because of their breadth, they, uh, they cover a wider range of things. So the Quran and the Hadith are the, there's also the virtual lives of Muhammad and uh, past Bibles. Those tend to be the, the central forms of uh, uh, teaching with, within Islam. Um, what do they teach? Uh, Islam, like other religions, tends to be integrated. It's not just a series of little doctrines. And, you know, doctrine number one, doctrine number two, doctrine number three, they, they fit together. Uh, but in terms of, of summarizing them, and let us say, uh, for Muslims, um, belief itself is not enough to bring, out some, bring about salvation. Actual religious practice marks the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. And there are basically what are usually called the five basic pillars of Islam. Uh, these are firstly an affirmation of the oneness of God. Uh, secondly, the importance of prayer. Thirdly, mandatory charity. Fourthly, the observance of Ramadan. And fifthly, making the pilgrimage, the Hajj, to Mecca. Uh, some comments about this. Uh, Muslims um, very much emphasize the unity of God. This is a doctrine called Tawid. That God is a unity. Very strongly emphasized. And there's nobody alongside God, there's, uh, there's nobody <coughs> like God. God is also very transcendent. God is extremely distant, extremely unified. And this emphasis on, on the unity of God may have been formulated 
directly is a criticism of Christianity. Uh, for, for Muslims, uh, the Trinity would is basically incomprehensible. I mean, obviously, at some point you can comprehend that, but it could just just seems so strange. And in opinion, of this the doctrine would say it's incomprehensible for Christians. But let's be honest, it's not that easy either. Uh, but it's literally incomprehensible uh, for most Muslims. Seek to explain that as they'll just believe you're a part of polytheist. You believe in three gods. Christians are often called polytheists by Muslims. You just have many gods. Or if you really don't have many gods, you have God's companions, so to speak. If you go to the Dome of the Rock um, in, uh, in Jerusalem and look at the inscription around that dome, uh, the first sort of uh, major Muslim building, and uh, it basically says, uh, you know, God has no son and no companions. God is one. And in that context, is understood to be a criticism of, uh, of Christianity. And to become a Muslim, uh, you simply have to affirm twice that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is his prophet. Do that twice and some Muslims would regard you happy having become a Muslim. And uh, if you then went to church next Sunday, they might kill you. I said, some Muslims, I mean, I work with Muslims every day, uh, they would say, that's nuts. I mean, the whole point of saying it twice is you really have to show your commitment that you really mean this to say it once. But if you do get some weird things happening, someone says that, and then, you know, in their sleep, what does that mean? Um, but, but very much the confession of one God, the unity of God, an eternal and absolute unity. Okay. In terms of prayer, uh, a pious Muslim five times a day uh, will turn to the Kaaba in, in Mecca and perform their prayers. These prayers are believed to be follow the example of Muhammad during his lifetime. Each prayer consists of reciting the first surah or chapter. Quran, um, as well as followed by different verses and different occasions, and giving praise to God. So, that prayer need not be in a mosque. Uh, going to mosques does not mean you take the central of Islam. You, you do that prayer wherever you are. Thirdly, charity, there is a, a tax, uh, as a cat, you can spell it various ways, as in a K A T. Is usual one. This is a tax basically on your wealth. It's not an income tax, it's a wealth tax. That you give a certain proportion, uh, usually 2.5% of your wealth, to charitable works. And often these works are collected in sort of foundations or work. And um, this often provides uh, a payment for imams and others or building mosques or other more direct charitable work. Uh, fourthly, uh, the observance of Ramana, that uh, you, you do not you fast from sunrise to uh, sunset uh, for a month, the month of Ramana. Ramana is a lunar month, so if you follow a solar time, like ours, it keeps shifting throughout the year. That's why you might notice I always get the impression Ramadan seems to come up every, every six months. Uh, Tuesday, about 29 to 30 days, you abstain from food, drink, sexual intercourse, and other actions considered uh, inappropriate. And um, at night, you feast. Um, it's celebrated in different ways in, in different countries, in places like Saudi Arabia. Uh, like most things in Saudi Arabia, it's a very solemn occasion. Um, in somewhere like Egypt, a Ramadan is a sort of celebratory time. And you fast during the day and the evening after sundown, everybody gets together and you, you have meals and you stay up most of the night. And, and uh, so it's a very happy time, that's sort of overtones of Christmas, if you put it that way. And then uh, any able bodied Muslim, particularly any able bodied male Muslim, uh, should, if they are able, 
once in their life and make the hut the pilgrimage to Mecca and perhaps also to uh, sites around uh, Medina. Uh, physically, Mecca being the physical center of the world. So, those are the sort of five basic pillars. Those are the, the things that Muslim is, is required to believe and required to do. Uh, one thing uh, you might know is the very simple and very direct. Uh, one reason for the sort of tremendous power and strength of Islam, it's, uh, put this way, it's a very focused, clearly structured religion. It's fairly easy to become a Muslim. And if you're a Muslim, it's fairly easy, in terms of basic stuff, to know what it is you have to do. Obviously, working out the details of that, of course, of all our lives would bring a million different problems. Uh, but it has a focus and uh, an impact. Uh, other uh, central ideas, um, one, as we mentioned, the, the unity of God, um, stress on the Quran as the eternal word of God. Uh, Muhammad as a prophet, uh, but more than a prophet, he is a messenger. Uh, Muslims believe that um, God has sent many prophets. Uh, those prophets who, who left a written text are then called, called messengers. And that God has sent uh, many prophets. So, Abraham <coughs> is regarded as a prophet, as a messenger. Moses is regarded as a prophet, a messenger. Jesus is regarded as a prophet, a messenger. And then Muhammad is the final one. There cannot be one afterwards. And so Muslims uh, particularly attack anything within the Islamic orbit, which they think speaks of a prophet being after Muhammad. One reason the religious group of the highest get persecuted, they developed in Iran in the 19th century, is the belief to have maintained that the Baal, the, their central figure, was a prophet after Muhammad. Ahmadi is another group. A similar thing. The Egyptian court in February, uh, a case, the, the uh, first case I know of in modern history, where a Muslim who converted to Christianity uh, took a legal case to try and force the government to change his identity papers to reflect his new religion. The Egyptian government will not do that for very fun. Uh, uh, that man, Ghazi, is now in hiding, the lawyer is in hiding. But the court decision said, you cannot do that. Why? Because you cannot go backwards in religion. You cannot go from the final religion back to an earlier one. So the idea that these religions go that, that with Muhammad, it is the final step. Uh, again, uh, that's, that's very, very essential. You cannot have one and let me also say a few, a few more things about this. That, no, I'll hold, hold on now, I'll let go through these uh, things first. Uh, Muslims believe in angels, jinn, who are the agents of God. Muslims also believe in the last day, the resurrection of the dead, the day of judgment. People will be held accountable for their beliefs and be sent to eternal life, either in paradise or in hell. And by the way, Jesus will appear in the last day as a judge for, for Muslims. Not the man, but Jesus. And also a, a strong stress within Islam on that everything which happens is divinely preordained under the authority of God and Allah according to his will. So extremely strong stress on how everything is preordained and very strong stress on the will of God. And much, uh, I touch on this later, but uh, the will of God, that God wills something, um, has much more centrality in Islam than it does in Christianity and that makes the theology quite clear. If you um, 
more radical Muslims these days and uh, the more radical ones, terrorist groups, uh, also maintain quite a lot of their writings, apart from the five pillars that I mentioned, uh, maintain that jihad is also a pillar of Islam, the sixth pillar of Islam. So you can get that in there emphasize. As you probably know, the word jihad literally means striving. And that, that's its root sense. But it's also true that historically, you know, 95% of the usages of the word jihad refer to war. And in connection with this, also with the Islam, it's fairly deeply rooted that the world is divided. Historically, the world's been divided into two worlds. Dar al-Islam, the realm of Islam, where Islam rules. Islam itself means submission. And the Dar al the realm of war, that which is outside of the Muslim world. So, very much binding to the Muslim world and the rest, the rest seems the realm of war, either they're fighting because people outside of Islam are fighting amongst themselves, or we need to be prepared to fight them. So a lot of Muslim thinkers are seeking to uh, get away from that kind of, kind of realm of truce or of uh, other kinds. But there is an attempt to talk about jihad as a, uh, as a single thought. Let's compare some of these beliefs to uh, uh, Christian beliefs. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Muslims believe that people such as Abraham or Moses or Jesus did receive a revelation from God. They are prophets of God, even more they are messengers of God. And ones that, that leave a written word, a written word of, uh, of guidance. They, they too revealed the will of God. <coughs> uh, but Muslims have also maintain that all of these people were Muslims. Abraham was a Muslim. Moses was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim. That what happened is that God revealed to them essentially what was later revealed to Muhammad. Maybe not all of it, but the message was the same. And that was the message they taught. And that was the message that they wrote down and was handed on. And that was the message originally contained in the scriptures, the Old and New Testament. But first the Jews, and then later on as the Christians, have corrupted the text. Either deliberately because they, they find it too difficult to deal with, or perhaps inadvertently. But in any case, the Old and New Testaments are regarded as, as a revelation, but which has now become corrupted, so it isn't really trustworthy. And if you looked at what it was originally, it will teach exactly the same thing as Islam. So that um, for, for Muslims, uh, we would be followers of a other things of a sort of corrupted revelation. But we have a status because that we're dealing with some kind of revelation. So we are people of the book. Christians and Jews are people of the book. And that means for Islam, Christianity and Judaism have a higher status than Hinduism or Buddhism or, uh, or other religions. But so that if, if Christians really knew what Christianity was about, they would be Muslims. That's why very commonly, if Muslims will not, will not speak about someone converting to Islam, but will speak about reverting to Islam, going back. So for a Muslim, a Christian isn't so much converting and giving up Christianity, is so going back to what Christianity actually was, that is Islam. And um, so you, you will see the term uh, revert being used. <coughs> About Jesus himself, Jesus was, was a messenger, but um, 
To Muslims, Jesus is not divine, not the only begotten Son of God. In fact, for Muslims, they would just usually would not know what that means. So if we say Jesus is divine, how can we be divine? God is God of the earth, and with this man is not. It has none of the attributes of the divinity. So that Jesus was not divine, he was not the only God of the Son of God. And that Jesus was not crucified. Uh, Muslims do believe in the Virgin Birth, but do not believe that Jesus was crucified. He simply appeared to be crucified. So that Jesus did not die for the sins of the world, nor did he rise from the dead. And uh, uh, Muslims maintain that uh, we really, well, Jesus really taught was the sins of what Muhammad taught. And uh, views of the divinity of Jesus doctrine of the Trinity are things which Christians have added on later. Let me just uh, close in this section so very quickly just go through at least a couple of um, the very schematic forms um, some Muslim uh, beliefs. Uh, it, I'll just read the right hand side I'm assuming most of you know the left hand side um, within Islam, there is, is no atoning work. That is, uh, no action like another which we, through which our sins are forgiven and through which we are restored to relationship with God. Uh, there is simply, you stand before God, there is a sincere confession of sin and repentance by the sinner, and then one seeks to follow the teaching of Islam. So in that sense, while the most common reference to God within Islam is to be a God is the merciful, Allah the compassion is the merciful, that's probably the most common uh, naming of God uh, amongst Muslims. Um, yet the notion of forgiveness itself um, is not well developed within Islam. Um, it's very much in the works. You know, believe correctly and do correctly and your salvation um, depends upon that. As mentioned, if we, um, with crucifixion, Jesus was not crucified, although it appeared that he was, and then of course he did not, I mean, obviously he died at some point, but he did not die on the cross, and so he was not resurrected. Uh, see, Jesus, we've already said that that's perhaps the most important thing to emphasize. But Jesus is, again, prophet, second only to an animal, not the Son of God, not the Lion, and is not the Christ of God. And the last one I will mention, uh, these charts, by the way, are taken from the August Lamb of Crossroads, so you get those. Uh, forgiveness of sins is obtained by God's grace without a mediator. A Muslim must believe that Allah, God, uh, Allah is simply the accurate word of God, it was used by Christians before it was used by Muslims, uh, must believe that God exists and believe in the fundamental doctrines of Islam, that Muhammad is God's prophet, and must follow the commands of Allah given in the Quran. And um, if, if one does that, one has good hope, though not certainty, uh, that one will go to paradise. Uh, within Islam, some of those, those questions are sort of left open and uh, can create very great problems of exactly how many good works you need to do, how firm must your beliefs be. So that uh, the question of salvation for Muslims uh, is often a, a more troubling one than it would be for Christians. Anyway, I've outlined in a very systematic way some more basic Muslim beliefs and doctrines and differences between Christianity. Uh, we're going to have a longer question period at the end of the four sessions, but we still have a few minutes tonight, so let's just take five minutes for any questions you may have at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, let me en encourage you tomorrow. I mean, 
I moved out of my house this morning. The Packers are coming to my house tomorrow morning. The move has arrived on Monday, so I can, because I want to get out of my house tomorrow morning first thing, so uh, I have a slightly different incentive. Um, one other thing, by the way, just, just from the previous uh, lecture, it, in terms of books, there are a, a stack of, of good books on uh, Christian Muslim relations. Um, uh, two, I would particularly mention one edited by Dudley Woodbury, who I mentioned earlier. If you said Dudley, you would know Woodbury, very easy, and um, called, uh, I think it's, it's called Muslims, the title is something like Christians and Muslims on the Emmaus Road. And um, Dudley pastored a church in, in Kabul in Afghanistan, also one in Tehran, and I think also one in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. So he's, uh, he knows his stuff. Uh, as he said, they were all very tough postings, but nothing that prepared him for being a dean at Fuller, um, which he said was far more nerve-wracking. But uh, so there's that, and a book by Shireen Tabor. Uh, Shireen, S-H-I-R-E-E-N, Tabor, uh, T-A-B-O-R, called The Muslim Next Door. Uh, Shireen's an evangelical Christian, her mother's a Catholic, her father's a Muslim, and says we grew up by celebrating everything, you know. You hope Ramadan will get over in time this year so you can have Christmas. So, but it, it's, a, uh, it's a very practical down-to-earth book of the Muslims next door to you, most of whom are going to be very like us, particularly later generations, but the simple thing is like if you invite to dinner, she lives in California. If you die to dinner, you should probably dress up. Don't do the usual, you know, California dress up means you put a t-shirt over your swim trunks. Um, but uh, she said for Muslims, it would usually be more formal. If you turned up in, in your basic running shoes and jeans, it would not be good. Uh, but that sort of thing, but more. And I, it's, it's a good little book, and it should have got more attention than it did. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Some people said they were having difficulty. I, I can't understand that. I've got four microphones on me. And one is half an inch away from my lip, so I've been trying to avoid shouting. So anyway, but I think they've turned up the volume. But anyway, in, in the first session, we talked about uh, uh, some basic Muslim beliefs, and particularly in, in terms of a contrast with, with Christian beliefs. Uh, now I want to talk about something of the history of Islam, um, in particular uh, Islam's history in relation to the Christian world. Obviously Islam has a relationship to the Hindu world. Some parts that was much more important to them, or to, to Central Asia with the Mongols and uh, Buddhists and with Chinese and so on. But uh, talk about Islamic history generally, but with, with a focus on relation of uh, with Christianity. Um, many of you will seen, have heard, have read uh, something by Osama bin Laden. Then you will have noticed he calls Americans crusaders. Uh, he will often refer to, use a word like caliph. Uh, probably um, I think you're probably better informed than many, but for most Americans, often those words don't mean much, or if they do mean much, they're wrong about them. Was it Will Rogers says, uh, take what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's the things you think you do know but don't that get you into trouble. So uh, we need to have some idea of what those words might mean to him and to his listeners. Um, or again, uh, Samuel Huntington, who chairs the uh, Center for um, Area and International Studies at Harvard, uh, probably best known for his book, um, uh, The Clash of Civilizations and the Crisis of World Order. But one quote from um, Professor Huntington, some Westerners have argued that the West does not have problems with Islam but only with violent Islamist 
extremists. 1,400 years of history suggest otherwise. The relations between Islam and Christianity, both Orthodox, that is Eastern Orthodox, and Western, have often been stormy. Each has been the other's other. The 20th century conflict between liberal democracy and Marxism-Leninism is only a fleeting historical phenomena compared to the historically deep conflictual relations between Islam and Christianity. I think um, Huntington is too pessimistic in that. Uh, he's a very learned man, as worth quoting on that point. Uh, often also, our news media is very conspicuously uninformed and misinformed well, about religion in general, but often with Islam in particular. Uh, let me just uh, quote the opening words from a cover story in U.S. News and World Report on the Crusades. The opening words were, during the Crusades, East and West first met on the battlefield. Apparently in stark ignorance of the fact that East and West, by which they mean Christianity and Islam, had already met on battlefields in France, Italy, Spain, and many other countries after Arabs had invaded them. So uh, there is a lot we don't know, which we need to. And um, or to quote somebody else, Ambrose Bierce, um, who wrote uh, many sarcastic and, and funny works, including The Devil's Dictionary, which has some great definitions on lots of subjects. Uh, one of my favorite is definition of politics, says uh, the pursuit of public office for private reasons. Uh, the, uh, but on his, uh, referring to uh, history, he once wrote, says, uh, oh, geography, he wrote, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> a, uh, a quip too true to be uh, entirely funny. Um, to some degree, that's, that's also true of history. We start to learn about things sort of only when we have to. When I see that other quote from Winston Churchill, who says, Americans always do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> so, uh, history is not just what is taught in books and universities, if indeed it is taught there, but much more so is our understanding of who we are and how we got here. What are we? Who we are is to a large level who we have become through time, who our parents, our families, what, what has uh, shaped us. There's a tendency for uh, Americans to emphasize newness. It's always sort of the new thing. I mean, it's interesting now, this is not a sort of defense or justification of John McCain, but the idea that like being old would be a problem for a politician. There are very few countries in the world where that would, that would be considered a, a sort of disqualification. Um, the idea we put the, the past behind us, we want, we want something new. And so we're amazed when people seem to dredge up conflicts and insults over a thousand years old. It's what, what's with these people? I mean, um, so uh, the American South is a bit different. Uh, where the awareness of history is stronger. Uh, people who've known defeat remember history longer than those who have not. <coughs> but in the Islamic world, and indeed not just the Islamic world, but most of the rest of the world, uh, history, or what people believe is history, lives with us now. Defeats and celebrations long past are causes for revenge or celebrations. <coughs> in the wars in and around Iraq, there would be illusions. Saddam Hussein was always making um, uh, historical illusions. He called George W. Bush Hagulu, which probably went past most Americans. Uh, 
This was the Mongol Khan who destroyed uh, Baghdad earlier. The, the illusion is, of course, the Americans are, are uh, the new Mongols. The, um, <coughs> or in the Sunni-Shiite conflicts between Iran and Iraq before that, people would always be making historical references to some particular events which the population would know about. Or in Osama bin Laden's uh, videotapes, um, mentioned before, he refers to the caliphate. And <coughs> one of them he refers to the, this was about five, six years ago, you know, the tragedy of more than 80 years ago. Everybody's thinking, what happened 80 years ago? Is that about the foundation of Israel? No, that was just over 50 years ago. What was that? 1924? What happened in 19? Nothing happened in 1924. Well, uh, that's the year that uh, Mustafa Kamel, better known as Ataturk, abolished the caliphate for the first time in the entirety of Muslim history. The 1920 is a very significant decade for many Muslims. So these, these historical allusions uh, are, are very, very important. For many Muslims, because the past was much more victorious and seemed much more of a golden age than the present, often the history is much more alive than the present. And for many Muslims, that history tells a story of almost rapturous story of stunning success, followed by a dark litany of failure. And if we want to understand something about Muslims, we need to know that. Uh, let's go back to the, the early history. I mentioned that Muslims believe Muhammad was born in 570 in Mecca, here. Uh, died there in, in 632. When he died, he had he was the leading figure. He controlled Mecca and also Medina here and the area around. So he had essentially a, a, a kingdom, a country, a territory which he ruled about that size. Um, after his death, uh, Arab Muslim armies expanded outside from the Arabian Peninsula. That w the word Arab means people who originally come from here, Arabia. Uh, went north into what is now Baghdad and Syria and conquered those areas. Uh, they moved over into the areas of what is now Lebanon, Israel and Palestine and conquered those areas. <coughs> moved east into what is now Persia, further east over here. Then through Egypt and along the North African coast to what is now uh, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco over into Spain, across the Straits of Gibraltar. And Gibraltar is an Arabic word. <coughs> and up through Spain. Uh, this, this is a map in, of, in the year 750. But let's take 732, uh, where they went through France to about here. Um, and uh, in, in, the, uh, in the town of Poitiers, um, the, uh, this is where Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, uh, finally defeated and stopped the Arab expansion 150 miles south of Paris. The year 732, 100 years after Muhammad's death. That very same year, Muslim armies fought with Chinese armies on the Talus River here. So 100 years after Muhammad's death, there were Muslim armies in China and in central France. And they effectively controlled everything between them, at least on the southern boundary of the Mediterranean. This, see this line here, I'll trace it for you, is the limit of Muslim control in the year 750, just over a century after Muhammad's death. Uh, many things could be say, said about this. It is an amazing expansion. Uh, it also shows that the military aspect of Islam is closer to its heart than it is with any other of the major religions. Uh, because of that spread of control by, by military expansion. But also, before we 
before you get too hard on uh, Muslims in this score, as they were successful. You know, if the Byzantine Empire based it out of here in Constantinople, the inheritor of the Roman Empire, if it could, it would have done it. Uh, what the Muslims did was not something nobody else would have done. It was just unusual they succeeded. Partly because the Byzantine Empire had been fighting the Persian Empire and they almost knocked each other out by the time the Arabs arrived. And uh, also very many, <coughs> another thing to make about this is the vast majority of this area, the population is Christian. So this was a takeover of the Christian heartland. If we regard the areas around Jerusalem and Bethlehem and Nazareth as the Christian heartland, that is taken over. And remember, Iran was Christian. So was Afghanistan and going off into Mongolia. China was evangelized by Iranian missionaries in the 6th and 7th century. And there were about 40 bishops in Afgan Afghanistan at that same point. So these were largely, so it's a, a takeover of, of Christian areas. So you, you have this mammoth expansion. And uh, let me just move that map on a couple of hundred years so the boundary is clear. Uh, hold on. Where's that one? Uh, look now, the boundary of that expansion. This is about the year. Uh, Actually, 400 years on. This is about the year 1300. Uh, a pushback in Spain, the Reconquista in Spain, which went on for 800 years. Uh, bear in mind, you know, Muslims were in Spain for 800 years. I mean, this wasn't a 30 year invasion. Um, expansion across the Sahara, down the east coast of Africa, down to what is Mozambique and almost South Africa. Um, then slowly moving across India through what is now Pakistan and then down the Indus and the Ganges valleys, fighting in the way, moving north into Central Asia and then going to take, starting to take over the Byzantine Empire here. Let's just advance this once more till we get essentially the peak of Islamic expansion. Trace that line again. Now moving into what is now Russia, Ukraine. Um, then of course, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Macedonia, what is now Serbia and Bosnia, uh, Hungary and Austria. Uh, finally being driven out of Spain, still maintaining part of Italy. Further expansion here and this coast, but the major one has been reaching out into this area, into Europe, right across South Asia, and then um, not by military means, but by traders and missionaries through into Indonesia, Malaysia, and the map is in fact wrong, blame the University of Texas, but also the Southern Philippines, um, which is majority Muslim. <coughs> so you, you have this, um, this stunning expansion. As I say, in the early years, the Byzantine Empire and the, the, uh, the Persians had almost knocked each other out. Um, also, it was the case that many of the Christians in the eastern areas were regarded as heretics by the Byzantines, that is, the capital O Orthodox Christians. Um, the, many had not signed on to the Second Council of Chalcedon dealing with, with the nature of, of Jesus. And uh, groups such as the Copts in Egypt or Ethiopia or the Syriacs in what is now Turkey and Syria, uh, some of the Assyrians in what is now Iraq, members of the Church of the East and others regarded as heretics, often called monophysites. Now, <coughs> the question of whether or not you want to be a heretic or an infidel could be a difficult question. And I'm quite serious. Uh, Islam, like historical Christianity, is far tougher on those who are so to supposed to be inside but deviate, or who leave you, than the people who were never in there. You know, someone who's, uh, who's an unbeliever 
I mean, well, there they are, they're over there, they're doing their thing. But someone who's in your church spreading false doctrine, they're a problem. You discipline them, you don't discipline the guy living next door. And you know, in these areas, church discipline didn't mean go and talk to the elders, uh, mean, mean prison or execution. <clears throat> so that often the Christians in these areas were getting it pretty rough from Christians in the rest of the world. So uh, that also weakened their uh, resistance. For the Muslims, they were just unbelievers, where for the Byzantines, they were heretics. So there were uh, several reasons um, for this. A few other things about the history. As I mentioned, most of the conquered population were Christian. There were also a substantial Jewish population. Most of uh, Arabia was uh, before the large portions of Arabia before um, Islam were Christians and Jewish, uh, Christians and Jews. And Muslims uh, faced a question of the armies expanded and they sort of controlled all these places. Uh, but what do you do with all these other people? Because your army's in charge, but it's like only 1% or less than 1% of the people in the country. You can't run it. And uh, also, these people weren't Muslims. Um, what, what do you do with, with uh, all these people? The, um, one of the beliefs often defied was you could not forcibly convert them but you could force them to submit. Within Islam, remember the word Islam is, is submission, submitting to the way of God and doing God's will. It's best if you do God's will because you believe it and you become a Muslim. But even if you don't, if people follow God's law, even if they're not Muslims, that's good that they follow the right way, they follow the right path, they follow God's law, and law is central to Islam. So military expansion and conquering was allowed to spread the rule of Islam. You were allowed to conquer unbelievers and subject them to Islamic rule. In fact, it was your duty to do so. But you were not, in principle, you are not to force them to become Muslims. Now that did happen, not all the time. There's enough occasions when you can point out that, that people faced a choice of sort of uh, death, slavery, or conversion. That did happen. Uh, but that was not in principally doctrinally true. The point was to conquer them so that Muslims, the ones of the final, true, pure religion, actually composed those of earlier or lesser religions. So it, it was Muslim rule rather than conversion per se, uh, which was the purpose. And, um, but uh, what else do you do with, with these people? Well, uh, what do you do when the majority of, of people are, are Christians and Jews, people of the book? Uh, under... Um, Islamic rule, uh, these people were called different spellings and pronunciations, dhimmi or dhimmi. Uh, most common spelling would be D-H-I-M-M-I. And these are, are people of the book under Islamic rule. Uh, Hindus, Buddhists, and so on would be something else again. But these people could be, could be tolerated because Though it was corrupt, they had a, uh, a true uh, revelation. Joan Peters describes the basic dhimmi status. Uh, this, this was first elaborated by Omar or Umar, the, the first caliph after Muhammad had died, the first leader of the Muslim world. Uh, he led that expansion out of Arabia up into Syria, and then this question of, Okay, we've conquered it. We've got all these, these Christians and Jews here. Uh, what do we do with them? And uh, uh, under something which is now known as, as the sort of Pact of Umar, the Pact, the Agreement, the Treaty of Umar, um, 
lists 12 conditions for the life of a dhimmi or non-Muslim, person of the book, the non-believer amongst the believers. Um, there were various restrictions. Um, they were forbidden to touch the Quran. They were to wear a distinctive garment, sometimes dark blue or a black habit with a sash. Uh, Jews were compared to wear a yellow piece of cloth on their clothing. Christians, often it was, it was blue. Uh, they were not allowed to perform religious practices in public, only within side of church. Not allowed to own a horse, because horses were deemed noble animals, almost right, a donkey. Not permitted to drink wine in public and required to bury their dead without letting their grief be heard by the Muslims. Uh, there were um, other things which could be mentioned too. A, a lot of it, uh, those are the conditions you had to keep, and if you keep those, then you could practice your religion and you could stay alive. If you violated them, you could be killed. And in fact, uh, the Christian community was held responsible for other Christians violating it. Um, the whole thrust of this, and of course, you could not speak about Islam to Muslims and, uh, or try to convert Muslims. That you could maintain your ceremonies and your, your uh, meet inside the church, but quietly. It should never be there in public. That a Muslim going about their daily affairs would not normally be in contact with and be aware of uh, Christians and Jews. Another restriction was you could not put up new churches or repair old ones, uh, which meant there's a sort of slow suffocation policy because the churches are slowly going to uh, collapse. So there was this sort of repressive set of, of conditions um, under which the people of the book lived. Um, so to say that in, in this context that Islam was simply wonderfully tolerant of other religions is not true. But something else needs to be said. What would be the condition of a Muslim in the Christian world at this point? Do you know? They were not allowed to be there. They would be killed or they would have to leave. So that uh, when you, again, we should not be anachronistic. Uh, but I you know, want to say, no, life was not marvelous for non-Muslims under Muslim rule. But again, don't think this is particularly unusual. When people said they were second-class citizens, no. Citizenship was not invented in the Western world till about 400 years ago. Uh, I mean, the Romans had it, some other people had it. But, I mean, the idea that everybody was free and equal human beings, uh, sorry, this opinion wasn't running around the world in the year uh, 635, 636. The Muslims were not unusual. So don't say it's too marvelous, but don't understand this as some, you know, peculiar wickedness brought upon the world any more than the Islamic expansions were. That's what people did, and they did it in the Christian world, too. So you, you, you've had, and sometimes life could be easier. Some, um, some caliphs, some sultans, some rulers um, didn't really bother. Um, in other cases, it got worse, and these rules were, in fact, violated, and people were massacred. Oh, and one other thing, is you needed to pay extra taxes. And usually, to be, in principle, to be given once a year in humiliating circumstances. So that a lot of the taxes came from the, from the non-Muslims who came in. And uh, in fact, in later years, they, there was a problem. The Muslims are getting worried about the people converting because the tax base was eroding. So if you, all these people become Muslims, where are we going to get the money? So Muslims paid some, I mentioned with, with zakat and so forth. So again, as you'll see, it may annoy you, but I, I will do a few on the one hand, on the other hand, because a lot of it's like this. 
you know, people say, oh, Islam is, is just this sort of evil, warlike religion, and that's what it is. Well, there's some truth in that. Uh, it's also true that like, you know, life for Christians in, in a lot of these settings is better than it, it would be for, uh, for someone else. And then other, you know, the Byzantines uh, made war. Constantine made, made war. So there we go. So we, we have this particular setting. And you've got this area um, uh, conquered by, uh, at first, the heartland was Arabs. And usually Arabs led it. But over here, it was tended to be other people. Uh, but then there was a further invasion from this area of Central Asia by the people we now call the Turks. They came in, in various waves. And the earliest wave, the Seljuk Turks, who were quite successful. They started defeating the, the Arabs. And they also went, uh, let me back up one. Uh, this wave coming in here is the Turkish expansion. The Arabs would never be able to get far against the Byzantine emperor. Remember, this is Eastern Orthodoxy. Constantinople is its center. Uh, but the Seljuk Turks were doing quite well, and they started charging along through Anatolia here, marching to Constantinople. So the Byzantine emperor sent a letter to the pope. He said, we really need help. We've been fighting against Islamic armies for basically, at this point, 400 years. And now this new Mambam coming out of Turkey, uh, so coming out of Central Asia, and we need help. Otherwise, they're going to defeat us. <coughs> so there was discussion of this in the Western Church. Remember, there's two wings. They have the Eastern Church here, Western Church over here, Rome and Constantinople. Const you know, <coughs> Constantinian moved the capital away from Rome to, and in all humility, named the new city Constantinople. And so the Pope and others discussed this and thought, yes, we should defend our Eastern brothers. Also, there'd be an attack on Christian pilgrims. Christians were making pilgrimages to Jerusalem and other places, and generally were allowed to. But there'd been increasing attacks on Christian pilgrims. And they thought they needed to be protected. And also, we should recover the Holy Land been taken from us. So there was this threefold mission. And so what we now call the Crusades were launched, uh, the first of them launched in, in 1095. And in one form or another, they lasted till about 1798, which is when Napoleon took over Malta. Uh, Malta was at that point the last surviving Crusader um, territory. The the Crusades are talked about a lot now. I would give you a quick historical judgment. Um, the Cru Crusades were usually very brutal and bloody and should be rejected on those grounds. The question of whether or not the rationale for the Crusades is justifiable, I tend to think it is and was. I mean, if, if you, if, if, if you're a pacifist, obviously you disagree. But if you believe there are grounds for war, uh, that this was argued for as a defense against the people marching here. And to recover these lands, which were earlier uh, sort of taken over by the Muslims. So I, <coughs> my dis description of the Crusades, to borrow Bernard Lewis's words, would be um, a short a short-lived, failed attempt by the Christian world to recover lands which the Muslims had conquered. The Muslims <coughs> didn't regard them <coughs> as important. They hardly ever wrote about them. They didn't refer to crusaders. They spoke, referred to Franks, French people. They thought the Byzantine emperor had been hiring mercenaries in the West. Um, that's how they saw it. And of course, they had a much bigger problem because the Mongols were invading at the same time. And the Crusaders, for a period of 150 years, controlled this little area here, whereas the Mongols went charging all the way down uh, into Egypt and killed hundreds of thousands as they went. Any one Mongol attack killed more people than the Crusaders managed to do in 150 years. So the Mongols were the big problem for the Arabs. The Crusaders were just these sort of bands of people on the fringes. 
So <clears throat> the modern fuss about the Crusades is modern. It was not a very big issue for Arabs or Muslims back then. Of course, they didn't want them, they didn't like them, they're fighting, they're coming in, but uh, that was the case. So it was, but the major pattern is, of course, to move ahead, that, ex oops, that expansion. It was just for a period of 150 years, there was a slight incursion back here and went bad. But the usual pattern is that, that continuing uh, expansion within the, uh, within the Muslim world. So those are the comments about the Crusades. If I were um, giving a history lecture generally on the relation uh, between these two things, I would miss out the Crusades as being not particularly important or relevant. Now you can't because everybody talks about the Crusades so you've got to mention them, but historically um, not too much. And when bin Laden and now many other Muslims go on and on about the Crusades, I just think it's um, historically not really relevant. They were not the expansion of Western imperialists trying to take over the Middle East. Um, it was an attempt at a counterattack. So, <coughs> after the Crusades, uh, one had the continuing expansion of the Muslim world, as shown on that map, uh, of the Moors holding on into Spain, the Tatars moving into Russia, the Turks into the, the Balkans. The Christian reconquest succeeded in Spain, later on in Russia, and eventually in the Balkans, uh, but it failed in what was called the Holy Land. But after we have <coughs> After the Seljuks, we have what we call the Ottoman Turks, and they did take over Constantinople, destroyed here, and continued on into the Balkans. And at the time of the people we now call the Ottomans, or the Ottoman Empire over here, this is probably the high watermark of Islam. Look at this map. This is the boundary of Islamic rule. It wasn't, just, it wasn't one country, it wasn't one territory. It would be like drawing the boundaries of Christian rule. They were, you know, the Pope didn't say jump and everybody jumped. I mean, emperors were fighting with emperors and kings. And so this was all, you know, there were Mughal empires in India, the Safavid empires in, here in Persia and all sorts of other things. But this was the territory controlled by Muslims. And there was a sense that, that this is the Muslim world, Dar al-Islam. The Muslims within it are the people. So there's some consciousness of a unity, even though there's as many fights going on inside as would be outside. And in principle, there was an official ruler, the caliph, the successor to Muhammad, the one who sort of officially rules over the Muslim world. So sort of usually not in practice. It would be like sort of the Queen of England who doesn't actually run the place, but you said, but that really is the sovereign. And that was now... The, uh, the Turkish sultan, based in uh, Constantinople, now named Istanbul, fulfills uh, this rule. So the idea that all of this area was nom nominally under the rule of a Muslim caliph, that consciousness was there. This is the land of Islam. Uh, so if you regard it as one territory, it's the largest empire in the history of the world. It dominates the world. Uh, Christians, the area, area controlled by Christians, there's still Ethiopia in a few places, is the sort of wet and cold part of Europe, northwestern Europe here. Oops. Uh, black Africa, not many dominant kingdoms there. India, they've taken it over. There's China. China would really be the only uh, possible um, rival, but China kept within its borders and didn't do that. For the rest, in the heartland of the world, the Americas aren't really relevant to here. For most of this, they hadn't been discovered, at least by Europeans. Uh, it dominates the heartland of the world. Anybody, if any of these other places wanted to trade with each other, you trade through the Muslim world. The Muslim world was politically more powerful, generally militarily more powerful. Uh, it was richer. Its buildings were generally better, or often better. 
Uh, literature was good. Philosophy was good. Uh, the arts and sciences were flourishing. Um, algebra is a uh, yet another one of those uh, Arabic words we have borrowed. So here you have the memory of this sort of world-spanning empire. And when Muslims look back to the history, it's often this they think about. But <coughs> then something changed. And this is traumatic. Because remember, within Islam, there is um, <coughs> the place of suffering or patience or defeat is much less prominent than it is within Christianity. I don't want <coughs> to say it's absent, but it does not have the significance that uh, for Christians, one of our dominant images, central part of our belief, is Christ crucified, giving up his life. You know, at a worldly level, a failure, the suffering servant. The, or take the contrast <coughs> between two different words which are now often translated as martyr. You have the Arabic word shaheed, um, <coughs> which in, in, at least in its modern usage is often applied to sort of uh, suicide uh, bombers. Uh, <coughs> But they are, they lose their life, but in an act of overcoming somebody else. The Christian notion of a martyr is someone who dies for their faith. The notion of giving up is there. So there's a different direction in those words. So again, I don't want to say it's absent in Islam, but it is there. The notion of uh, success, again, the word Islam means submission, uh, of overcoming, making people submit. That's a much stronger theme within Islam. And essentially, Muhammad was successful. He started a new religious movement. In the end, he controlled his hometown and the, the areas around that. <coughs> he was militarily successful, and his followers were. It's the final religion, it's the final revelation. Is the truth to which all will sub submit, and, ju and judgment day will come. You expect success. And if you're a Muslim, and you believe it's the final revelation, it will be the successful one, and you look at your first thousand years of history, then pretty well everything you see around you in the world confirms your belief. It fits. History is consonant with theology. And so this would affirm your strength, your belief as a Muslim. But it falls apart. Uh, what would be the turning point? Well, it's history. There's no magic turning point. You can't say, oh, they're doing well till that day, and it turned. What happens is you're winning most of your battles, and then uh, still most of them, but not as many as before, and then you're losing a few, then you start to lose more than generally. You know, history changes direction over a period of, of centuries. There wasn't one dramatic turning point. Um, but if you wanted to pick one date, easy date to remember, uh, the date to pick would be September the 11th. 1683. You'll remember that. <coughs> this was the, if you want to pick one date as the height of Muslim expansion, probably that. This was when the Ottoman Turks were again laying siege to Vienna. Uh, they'd been at Vienna again uh, 150 years before. By the way, when Martin Luther wrote about the Turks, on a clear day, he could hear their cannon. He's not right in talking about the Turks in Turkey. He's talking about the Turks in Austria. 
remember that most of Europe has, for at least a period of several centuries, been under Islamic rule at one point. Uh, but the Turks are back again. Um, they, they didn't really, they weren't really defeated last time. They sort of gave up and went home. They weren't defeated. Um, but on September the 12th, they were badly. And they slowly retreated and they had to sign treaties which you were humiliating, which made it clear, you lost. Like it wasn't a neutral standoff. Okay, you get that river and we'll have these mountains. And slowly pushed out of Austria right through Hungary, right through uh, Serbia. Later on in the Balkans, the Greeks revolted. Remember, Greece was under Turkish rule for about 600 years. It's one reason that you may have noticed that Turkey and Greece have a lot of problems with each other. A lot of history there. Uh, Bulgaria, Romania fought against that. So you have a pushback in the Balkans. And that area slowly gets sort of retaken by Europeans. Similarly here, the Russians take over these parts of Russia and then Ukraine. The Muslims are pushed back into Crimea. The Russians don't stop. They go down and start conquering places in the Caucasus, which we'd never heard of a while ago, but now we know some names, like Chechnya. And then carried on into Central Asia. Spain, we have noticed. But then another thing was happening. Uh, remember I mentioned if you wanted to trade, if you wanted to trade with China, you had to go through the Muslim world, which was allowed. The Muslims like trade. Muhammad was a trader. So within Islam, business and trading are like very good things you could do. Uh, so it wasn't that you, you know, infidels were forbidden to trade across it. It was just a long walk and very expensive. You might get attacked by bandits, but if you didn't, like every city, they'd say, oh, good, here comes another caravan, trade in peace, and we'll take 10%. And if you have to go through 10 cities, that sort of adds up. So here was a problem. And, you know, the Portuguese wanted to trade in the east, so they sailed around. That's what they did. They were sailing around Islam to get to over here. Then another guy had a bright idea. I mentioned the, the, uh, the Muslims, the Moors, were in Spain for 800 years. Their last stronghold was in the city of Granada, right down here. And the final defeat of the Muslims in Spain took place in 1492. And Ferdinand and Isabella, the emperor and empress were feeling in pretty good mood. When this sort of wanderer came up with a crazy plan to sail to China, his name was Christopher Columbus, and he picked an auspicious time for his grant application uh, in that uh, Ferdinand and Isabella had just finished retaking Spain, so we're feeling good. But Columbus was trying to sail around Islam by going that way and end up in China. It wasn't just the geography, many of these things, it's Islam. The European voyages of exploration are partly the European ways of how do we get in touch with the rest of the world out there with all these Muslims between us. So there's, there's a very central element um, there. And that also mean Europeans sort of also conquered as they went. They started setting up bases over here at various places. And then, so, you know, British say of bases in India, and they thought, well, you know, while we're here, why don't we just, like, take over the place? Um, so, not quite a lot of these were trading things, but then the British decided to take over India, and later on they talk, took over what is now uh, Malaysia and Sri Lanka. The Dutch took over Indonesia, the Spanish took over the, uh, the Philippines, and uh, British established colonies right down here, West Africa, uh, sorry, West Africa, East Africa, French, Portuguese, and others did it. Note, so what we call colonialism, the first phase of colonialism. Note who they were taking it over from. I mean, there were, Muslim, there were Hindu rulers in India, but the dominant powers in India at the time were Muslims, the Mughals, Mughals. That's who was controlling a lot of West Africa and East Africa and these areas that in the outlying areas of the Muslim world, Christians, infidels, are taking it over. So you've been pushed out of here, 
And now you're getting controlled here and here and here and here. I got big fingers too. Gets worse. Um, in 1798, for reasons I've still never been able to work out, Napoleon decides to take over Egypt, which he does quite easily. And uh, stays there a while. The Egyptians cannot defeat him. The Ottomans cannot defeat him. He's actually kicked out by the British under Admiral Nelson. Uh, the Battle of uh, Abu Kia Bay, just outside Alexandria. I was there two years ago. We went and sort of looked out. There's nothing you can see. It's just the ocean. But as an ex-Brit, I just wanted at least to gloat for a bit. Um, and then the British, so the British didn't exactly take over Egypt, they sort of arranged a compact with the rulers, but basically the British hung around for the next 150 years, which is British habit. Um, but then you get other takeovers. You know, the French go down to Algeria, the Italians go down to Tunisia. And so not only it's European recovery, not only outlying in Asia and here, but the Arab heartland gets taken over. Then the Ottoman Empire centered here in the First World War allies with Austro-Hungary and Germany and loses. It collapses. And it was sort of the last of the uh, major Muslim empires controlling not just what is now Turkey, but a lot of North Africa uh, down through Iraq and, and Northern Arabia. And so that the Ottoman Empire collapses. Uh, the area, this area is divided up between Britain and France. Britain gets what we now call uh, Iraq, uh, then Palestine, and the French get Syria, and, and whatever, and the Brits still have this. So the Arab heartland is carved up. Uh, then it gets worse. At this point, from this area of control by Muslims, when you get to 1924, only five areas of the Muslim world are actually run by Muslims. One is Afghanistan, one is Iran, one is Turkey, one is Arabia, and the other is Yemen down here. And these are almost one place. And these are almost nothing anyway. As mentioned, Ataturk, a strong secularist, deposes the caliphate, 1924. First time since 632. That's happened. As I say, it was a nominal rule, but the idea that there was always a caliph there, the symbol of the unity of Muslims, and the idea that we should be together and ruled under God's law, gone. So Turkey might be sort of majority Muslim, but it's, you know, secularist. You know, it's more secular than the French. Iran under the Pahlavis is getting very similar. So they were secular rather than Muslim. Afghanistan was sort of the back of beyond. So the only substantial Muslim territory was sort of that area which Muhammad had at the beginning, ruled by Muslims. So in a space of 300 years from this to this. And let us just add, in the first Gulf War, the infidels showed up here too. Remember, that's Osama bin Laden's, his first basic grievance, was always. The infidels are in the land of the two holy mosques, the Arabian Peninsula, where no infidels should ever be. And you know, if you're a Muslim, and you watch the walls, the boundaries coming in on you like this, whoops, and they've sort of taken over everywhere, it appears they've taken over everywhere, and then, as you know, the, the Saudis asked for troops to come in to defend them from Saud uh, Saddam Hussein after he'd invaded Kuwait. But if you see all this stuff coming in like that, and you see this sort of pattern, which is, they keep getting closer on all sides, and then there's only one place they haven't been, and they show up there and say, hey, we're from America, we're here to help. And you think, hmm. Maybe they're not here to help. They're here as well. So that's a highly oversimplified view of history, obviously. 
there is, um, and also I've stressed the conflictual side. Yes, we've done 1,400 years of history, so we're, we're talking about the battles. Uh, it needs to be said there is as much trading going on as everything else. You know, when, if you want to know where we got all our oranges and spices and cloves and stuff like this. I mean, Muslims made alliances with Christians against other Muslims. Christians did it with, and all sorts of things. It wasn't just like there was this boundary and clash. Uh, all sorts of trading and mixing and, and all sorts of things going on. But you still see these movements of, of boundaries. And so for Muslims, there is this sense that um, you had 1,000 years of stunning success, followed by 300 years of crippling failure. And the question, the obvious question is, why? Uh, Bernard Lewis has a book partly on this theme, not quite, but what went wrong? And the huge, you know, continuing debate in the Muslim world, actually for hundreds of years, particularly with the Ottomans, been, they were thinking about this for 300 years. Uh, but it's still there. Why? What went wrong? Why were we so successful? And there are different answers to this question. Some Muslims say, because we didn't keep up, we got rigid and closed down. The third, in, you know, 800 years ago, we stopped the science of interpretation, ishtihad. And, so we become rigid and not open to questioning, and that's why we're in a mess. Others say, no, we have betrayed true Islam. We need to go back to the original, the successes, the original successes. The, these are the Salafists. We need a true pro-Islam. If we were like we were in the first generation, then we would be successful again. Bin Laden is one of those. I don't mean all the people who believe that are terrorists, but that, that, that's his sort of opinion. So that uh, debate is... Um, is still going on. But also, this is um, one of the reasons, not only amongst bin Laden sites, but for many Muslims, this a tremendous sense of aggrievement against the West, and the West is seen as Christian. Look what the Christians did to us. You know, they took over all our land. You can respond, yeah, well, you took over all ours, and you did it first, which I think is correct. It says, but you did it more recently. You know, you were the last, colonialism was the last phase of, one of the last phases of imperialism, so it, it resonates more. But there is that sense of, of grievance that uh, we as Christians have oppressed the Muslim world and do, and that we need to acknowledge that. So that gives us a small lead into uh, the first lecture tomorrow will be on situation of Islam in the modern world. Thank you very much. Thank you.